This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. In last week's episode, I introduced you to a man named Dayton Leroy Rogers, who was known by local sex workers as a creepy regular they called Steve the Gambler, a man who had a foot fetish, enjoyed bondage, and inflicting pain on women. Rogers was arrested for the murder of Jennifer Lisa Smith over the summer of 1987. Shortly after his arrest, while they prepared for his upcoming murder trial, authorities made the gruesome discovery of several mutilated bodies hidden in the Malala Forest. The similarities between the Malala Forest killings and Jennifer Smith's murder were undeniable, and soon detectives would unveil a prolific serial killer who would go on to have the longest-running court case in Oregon history. On Monday, August 31st, 1987, a few weeks after Jenny's murder and Rogers' arrest, a 46-year-old hunter by the name of Everett Lee Banyard took his crossbow out to the Malala Forest in the hopes of making a kill. He got a late start that evening, just after 7 p.m., but there was a little light left and he figured he could take his chances. Little did he know, he wouldn't make a kill, but he would discover someone else's. Ooh. As Banyard quietly made his way through the brush, he scoured the area looking for evidence of woodland creatures and the small disturbances on the ground. Now and then, his nose was hit with a strong stench. As he was employed at a fertilizer plant, his mind didn't initially consider anything off. As he began looking at his surroundings, he noticed someone else had been there. The disturbances all around him looked to be man-made. He walked on a bit further into a small clearing and spotted a pile of ferns that were no longer green like the other plant life around him. They were dry and brown and looked like they had been broken off and smashed down. As he peered at it, he believed there was something underneath it. He approached to investigate and the stench that he had whiffs of earlier grew more intense. At this point, he thought perhaps another hunter had been there before him, made a kill and left part of the carcass behind, covering it up with ferns. But as he pushed those ferns back with the toe of his boot, what he saw chilled him to the bone. Beneath the ferns were clearly the buttocks and leg of what was definitely a human body. He rushed back to his truck and drove home to call for police. Shortly after he called his discovery in, a deputy drove to his home to take a statement. Though he was overwhelmed and frightened by what he had found, he agreed to take the deputy out to the clearing where he had found the body. By the time they got there, it was pitch black. The clearing that Banyard had found earlier was easy to find and to smell. The deputy confirmed that there were human remains and made his way back to the cruiser to report his findings to a sergeant. Soon, the deputy was met with several other officers and a local medical examiner so that he could guide them back to the crime scene. Upon inspection, the medical examiner, George Coleman, noted that the body was nearly completely mummified with leathery and shiny skin. He wasn't sure what the sex was, but the body was found nude in the prone position. One of the hands was visible, but very oddly positioned, making him believe that the body had been thrown into the area and that the ferns were broken off from the plant and placed over the body among other leaves and grass to hide it. By morning, the body still remained as the sun came back up. Now that it was clearly visible, the scene around the body was more closely inspected. Near one of the legs was a white bottle, and a few inches away was a rusty can. Within a couple of hours after the initial photos were taken, the body was more closely inspected and the foliage that covered it was removed. There were large portions of putrefaction liquid exiting the body's orifices, as well as significant insect activity. The skull was exposed during the decomposition process, with the skin of the head, which still had light brown curly hair, slipping away. There were several missing teeth, and the third molars, or wisdom teeth, had not yet erupted. While both legs were intact, the body was missing their left foot, and you could see that it had been severed at the ankle. This was clearly a homicide. As they spread out to look for the foot, one of the detectives stumbled upon another body. At what age did the third set 
of teeth erupt? Typically, by your early 20s, they would have erupted. Thank you. Body number two was in the fetal position, nude, very decomposed, and was clearly missing both feet, which, like the other body, appeared to have been sawed off or cut at the ankle. This body was identified as having female characteristics. Next to the skull were clumps of long, curly, blondish-brown hair. Most of the teeth, which were noted as being very straight, were intact with the exception of one central left incisor that had fallen out and was laying on the ground next to the skull. As they bagged the body, they discovered the severed feet were lying underneath her. The crime scene had now doubled in size and everyone was bagging all the evidence they could find, whether cans or bottles or fibers. They also collected soil samples and plant samples from close proximity to the bodies. Within two more hours, another body was discovered. Wow. What, the, that's the third now in the same This is the third, yep. Jeez. Body number three was nude, and like the others, the scent of putrefaction was strong. As they examined the body, they could see a giant incision extending from the groin to the sternum. The gash was so deep that it exposed the vertebrae and part of the pelvis. As each hour went by, the seriousness of what they had discovered intensified. By 5 p.m. that evening, the sheriff's department brought in a canine unit so that a good old German shepherd pup named Colt could help search the area. Within 15 minutes of Colt's arrival, he found a fourth body. Jeez. Body number four was 40 feet to the north of the third body, so that was about 55 feet away from bodies one and two. The body was laying on its back inside a blackberry bush, and it was partially covered by dirt. It was nude and, like the others, very decomposed so that you could see the ribcage, pelvis, and vertebrae. The skull had a small amount of dry, leathery tissue still intact, and there was long, reddish-brown hair. Due to the level of decomp on this body, there was no scent that could be detected by a human, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, you like it's so far gone you can't smell it. What also makes wow. you wonder, was it there much longer than the other ones, or was there something about being like in a blackberry bush that maybe sucked out oh. the moisture? Yeah, I, I don't really know the science behind that, but I, I wonder because the others were a little bit more exposed and covered with yeah, dead Yeah, maybe plants. if there's more foliage, it's going to like eat up the nutrients. Especially the living because they'll say like yeah. it's like fertilizer to the ground and the plants yeah. eat that. So I wonder well, if that's that interesting. absorbed it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a scientist either, but that would make sense to me. Next on Murder in the Rain, <laughs> we dive into the science. I, I'm declaring that 100% factual. Did you look it up? No. Oh. Okay, well, I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you. Please grant me my award now. <laughs> Within two hours of the discovery of body number four, a fifth body was located. Body number five was lying face down, and its hands were bound with a one-inch wide, thick fabric. The skull was skeletonized, and the right foot had been cut or sawed off. A couple of hours into bagging evidence for the five bodies that were discovered, Two detectives were walking about a quarter mile away when they smelled the telltale sign of a decomposing body. After a few moments of searching, they found body number six near a heavily wooded area by a cliff edge. It was nearly fully skeletonized. Not far from where the skeleton was found was a curiously dark portion of ground. They scratched their heads wondering, had this body been laying in that spot and animals perhaps drug it away, or should they prepare themselves to find another body? What's your guess? I'm going to go with another body. Yep. Well, about 50 feet away from body number six, they found body number seven. This one was also nearly completely skeletonized and it was not intact. There was clear evidence of animal activity that scattered the remains multiple places. I don't know how many feet, but it was definitely everywhere. Wow. They were able to tell that the chest had several stab wounds. The discovery in the Malala forest was shocking to say the least, but as multiple bodies were found dumped in a wooded area, authorities looped in several teams, one of which was the Green River Killer Task Force. Mm. A few years prior, there was a lot of chatter that the Green River Killer had moved from Washington state into Oregon. Four bodies had been found outside of Tualatin, and two of them were Seattle sex workers who were eventually tied to the Green River Killer. Two of the victims, however, were never linked to him. But as this dump site wasn't too different from the dump site several of his victims were found in, they found it necessary to loop that task force in as they created their own Malala Forest Task Force. Wow. They also looped in other detectives who are working on cases closer to home. 
one of which was Detective Turner, who was working on the recent murder of Jenny Smith. And for some context, Jenny was murdered on the 7th of August, and the discovery in the Malala Forest started on August 31st, so it was just a few weeks apart. Turner made a visit to the Malala Forest crime scene, and this boy didn't have to be a mathematician to put two and two together. He saw something at the scene that set off his spidey senses and made him think that that call to the Green River Killer Task Force wasn't going to lead to anything which would eventually turn out to be correct once the autopsies were completed. The Green River Killer would be eliminated as a suspect in this case. As he stood alongside another detective searching the area around body number one and discussing their thoughts on what they were looking at, Turner looked down and saw a little item just to the right of the body. It was a tiny Smirnoff vodka bottle. He pointed it out and said to the other detective, Gilliland, I want you to pick up every bottle like this that you find. Gilliland mentioned that they were everywhere, all over the crime scene, at nearly every single body. In fact, they found 38 miniature bottles of Smirnoff vodka. They were all marked on grids, but Turner just replied, you better be sure to bag every single one. That's when Detective Gilliland realized Turner thought he knew who the killer was. That's really like something out of a movie, to just stumble upon body the grounds of a serial killer like this space that he thought was so hidden and secret and would be just tucked away forever yep and to just have it be yeah and just just to have them clustered there like oh it's so convenient to put them all here but of course if one is found they're all going to be found. yeah wow just to refresh my memory did he live near the forest Did, did he live in malala did he where was he from uh dayton yeah he uh, lived in Canby at the time. So last time, a lot of our episode focused on Portland, Canby, Woodburn. He had lived in Eugene originally. So okay. kind of just along the I-5. I see. Yeah. Okay. Is Malala south of Canby? Uh, or east? East. Okay. East. Okay. Yep. Thank very, you. very close. In last week's case, you'll recall a couple of things. One of Dayton Rogers' co-workers noted he drank heavily and often drank vodka and orange juice. I think I also mentioned a worker at a Woodburn OLCC store told detectives that Rogers came in two to three times a week and regularly bought mini bottles of vodka, sometimes in packs of 10. Well, one thing I neglected to tell you is that when they searched his truck after his arrest, there were several items taken from the bed of the truck. One of them was a small green plastic that seemed to come from the lid of a milk jug or an orange juice jug. You know, when you twist the cap off and there's that little ring, a little safety ring? It was one of those. Interestingly, also at the Malala crime scene were 34 empty plastic individual orange juice bottles, the kind that had a top very similar to the one I just described. It seemed Rogers did have a taste for OJ and vodka, the key ingredients for a screwdriver. Kind of poetic that his favorite drink would help screw him over because he took that little drink everywhere he went and detectives were good at their jobs. I'm I'm not a drinker, but I wonder what the purpose is of the little bot. Like if you're drinking that much, might as well have the financially speaking, Um, hiding them. Hiding them all over. So when they oh, interviewed so he his, could just carry it with him everywhere. Right. They oh, interviewed okay. his wife. They interviewed uh, a coworker that used to have lunch with him. No one ever saw alcohol in his car, oh. but it was everywhere. Glove box and bags behind under the seats. Like the little ones are just easy to hide. But also, maybe it's a habit. Maybe he tried it once and liked it. You know, people are yeah, weird. Yeah, or it's just like a controlled shot. Like I, mean, I prefer. Oh, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, it's like a, a way to to have like the illusion of control over. Sure. Over yeah. Only having a shot. Definitely. But like, I really like um, the sodium low sodium V eight, but I only like it out of a can. I don't like the big uh, bottle. Oh yeah. So maybe he likes. Yeah. Yeah. You just true. never know. People are people are weird little habitual creatures. Yeah. Well, and he's an alcoholic and as a serial dated, killer. <laughs> yeah. As someone who dated an alcoholic who would sneak off to get little bottles, it's like okay. Yeah. I guess if you're hiding it. I honestly think it's the being able to hide it factor. Yeah. That makes sense. Turner immediately jumped in and started working on this case. Now, because Rogers was already headed to trial for Jenny Smith's murder, they would have to be treated as totally separate and different cases, even the files being different, even though some of the witnesses may overlap. Two witnesses were very compelling at linking Rogers to the Malala crime scene. A truck driver named Mike Travis reported an incident from July 7th. 
Turner was alerted to the story and met with the truck driver out on a logging road not far from the crime scene. Travis recounted that he was working that day and stopped at a location which was about four miles from the Malala crime scene. As he stopped, he watched as a girl jumped out of a moving small pickup truck right in front of him, jumped out of the door. The girl ran towards him and told him that the driver had threatened to kill her. He helped her get to safety and called the incident in. Upon speaking to him, Detective Turner remembered the case. He had actually read the file right before he started investigating Jenny's case. Wow. He actually talked to the victim who ultimately got into Travis's truck. So here's her story. And I don't know her real name, but the book I read for this case called her Heather. That's not her real name, but we'll just call her that. 31-year-old Heather left her two children with a friend and she went to a local 7-Eleven to buy cigarettes. As she was walking there, a man in a blue pickup asked if she needed a ride. She ended up getting in and he said, why don't you help keep me company because I have to drive to Oregon City. The pair stopped at the 7-Eleven. He got a six-pack of beer and two Coke cans and she bought her cigarettes. Then they hopped back in the car and headed toward Oregon City. The man told her his name was Steve, and he began drinking pretty heavily and coming on to her while driving. Soon she realized they had driven past Oregon City onto a logging road near the Malala Forest. Heather became restless and asked when they'd be heading back, and he told her he wanted to drive to the hills where he could, quote, tie someone up and fuck them. She became incredibly scared at this comment, so when he went to touch her, she pushed him away. He then started driving erratically, and she started trying to get out of the car. With one hand on the wheel, he started to drive faster to prohibit her getting out, and all the while he took his other hand and struggled with her to keep her in the car. Eventually, she broke free from him, opened the door, and jumped out of the moving vehicle. She then spotted the log truck parked nearby and made a beeline for it. Her injuries were minimal, and as you know, the truck driver took her to safety. Shortly after the incident, Heather worked with a sketch artist to bring the star of her nightmare to life, but the case never went anywhere. Now that Turner had talked to Travis, the truck driver, he made him take a look at mugshots, specifically including Rogers in the lineup. Unfortunately, he could not be sure about who the suspect was, but he did accurately pick out the light blue truck that belonged to Dayton Rogers. Not only did this case sound familiar to Turner right out of the history book of Dayton Leroy Rogers' life, the truck was accurately selected. While it was not widely known that Dayton Leroy Rogers had become a suspect in the Malala Forest murders, people knew about Jenny Smith's murder and whispers started spreading around, the benefit of which can lead to some pretty great tip calls. A gal named Lisa, again a fake name, called police to say she had info on Rogers that she thought they would like to know. She mentioned that she had first met him in 1984 on Highway 99 East in Woodburn. She had been walking toward Hubbard when he pulled up next to her and offered her a ride, telling her how beautiful she was. He gave her a ride home and asked her out. She asked if he was married. He said he wasn't, which he was. Anyway, she agreed to the date and made plans for him to pick her up at 7 p.m. When he picked her up, she said he offered her vodka, tiny little bottles of vodka, Mm -hmm. noting that they were, quote, like those served on airplanes. She then said he stopped at the local Safeway and picked up orange juice. Then they were back on the I-5 heading towards Eugene. Eventually, their drive to Eugene turned into him driving her out to a remote logging road. He then turned to her and said he wanted to tie her hands behind her back. Before she could process whether he was telling a joke or being serious, he violently grabbed her, forcing her against the door and tied her up. Then he told her he was going to cut her breasts off. She freaked out, crouched on the floor of the passenger seat, and he calmly looks at her and asks, what's wrong? She's like, "Uh, I don't know. You just said you were going to cut my breasts off. So he continues driving. He stops again and he forces her to drink two of the vodka bottles and smoke a joint. And she said she didn't think it was marijuana, but there was something. It wasn't a cigarette either. Mm. Then he threw all the empty bottles, orange juice and vodka, out the window and drove off. Now, I assume at this point he lost all of his confidence because 3 a.m. rolls around and he ended up driving her home, dropping her off without any further incident. She never filed a report because all she wanted to do was forget that it ever happened. She did mention that she saw him a few times at the store after the incident and even confronted him once, telling him, 
about what happened and asking why he did it. And he just claimed to have no memory of the incident. Later, when police showed her some possible mug shots, within seconds, she pointed out Dayton Leroy Rogers and said, quote, I remember his nose. And I don't know if you remember last week, I mentioned one of the gals said he had a weird little yeah, nose. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, interesting. It's haunting. So if you're going to be a serial killer, make sure you have no weird, li- weird little nose. Another call came in from a man named Paul Samarin. He told police that his wife had showed him a map that had been printed in the newspaper that showed where the bodies had been found in the Malala Forest. As he looked it over, he suddenly realized he had been to that area with Dayton Rogers. (gasps) The pair had gone fishing after Dayton mentioned it was his favorite spot. Now, what was sick? I know. Now, what's completely impressive about this call is no one knew Dayton was being investigated at this time. He was still... Oh, so this is like an organic... Yeah, it was super organic. And he was still under wrap for under the wrap with Jenny. Like, no one knew he was the suspect. They had not mentioned it in the media. So this guy just calls and is like, yeah, I I was there with my buddy Dayton. And he said it's his favorite place. Wow. So that one detective who had a hunch is like, "Uh hell yeah, (laughs) he's right. He knows he's... He knew he was right the minute he saw that vodka bottle. After Banyard had led police to the first body, the one discovered while hunting, detectives went back to interview him. They were asking how often he had gone to the area and if he had hunted there before. He said frequently and estimated the number of times he had visited was likely in the hundreds. His kids even rode their horses on trails throughout the Malala Forest. He mentioned that he had been there a couple of times that summer and he'd even smelled something weird. um, But This is this blows my mind. He claimed he didn't really question it because a lot of locals dump dead animals there. So like farm animals or their pets, they just dump them in the forest. So to him, that's completely normal. And it just didn't trigger Mm. anything weird. Now, they did ask him, well, do you remember seeing anyone suspicious over the summer when you visited? And he said he had one day in either late June or early July He pulled up to park and get out so he could go hunting, and he saw a small, light blue pickup slowly driving up. The driver was male, and he was alone. And he watched on as the pickup drove by him down the road, and all of a sudden, a bunch of pigeons fly into the air. Now, he thought the guy must have released a bunch of carrier pigeons. Um, And I just want to note here, I don't think it's normal behavior to a dump a bunch of dead animals in the forest and have carrier pigeons around like to me I'd be like I hey police I just found this dead body and now let me tell you about the guy I saw earlier this summer like yeah or like what he just had them in his loose in his car and just opened the door and was like be free now I know we have a lot of pigeons in Oregon but I have honestly never seen a carrier pigeon yeah that's (laughs) no so I don't know I I just question like um people of Malala I know a couple of you listen (laughs) Are either of these things normal? Because to me, I, I think it would have set my my own spidey senses off at that yeah. point. What, what is the difference between a, uh, between a carrier pigeon Let and a regular pigeon? Let me tell you. I only know this because I watch a lot of TV and somebody made a this reference. messenger cap? Pigeons were never meant to be wild. They were bred in captivity to be carrier pigeons. And then they were just let go and then they bred on their own. So every pigeon you see, I, and I'm like 90% certain on this fact, is a descendant from a carrier pigeon and they do not know how to like properly care for themselves in the wild. So that's why you see them hanging oh, around big cities because they that's don't know. they eat like human junk. Yep. And they don't know how to make their own nests. And again, I don't know why I think I know everything and I should be on Jeopardy. P- feel free to fact check this. <laughs> <laughs> that's very interesting. I hope it's accurate. I hope it is too because I recently learned that and um, <laughs> I don't remember my source, but it was... Highly likely television. So interesting. So, but feel free to look that up because so basically all pigeons are carrier pigeons, right? And but like some are kept like so. Basically, the guy thought maybe this guy had pigeons at and home just let them go training or breeding or whatever. well, you know, people will let their lizards out or their their parrots or something. And it's I'm like, always they're not, letting lizards out. They're not meant right. to be let out of captivity, especially when they're not native, right? Um, and. I know we see a lot of pigeons in our day-to-day life, but I, I do not think they're meant to be out in the forest. That's fascinating. 
As they began to process the bodies and begin the autopsies, detectives started to question why victim number five was still bound while all the other victims had been bound but were found with their bindings removed. One detective thought maybe victim number five was dumped that day when Banyard saw the pigeons. What if the killer came to dump the body as he normally would, but couldn't because Banyard was there? Oh. So instead, he sloppily threw the body out into the woods and the pigeons set off. And unfortunately, Banyard couldn't ID the person. So it just went on because like he didn't remember exactly when it happened. Yeah, that would kind of make sense. It would, right? So they could never prove it. But it remains a theory of why maybe he did see pigeons that day. But then I would be wrong and pigeons would live in the forest. <laughs> but that's OK, too. But it could have also just not been pigeons. Maybe just another. Small Very bird. true. I mentioned earlier that once the autopsies were conducted, they were able to rule out the Green River killer who, like the Malala forest killer, dumped multiple bodies in the same location. Well, authorities had two questions on their minds. One, could this be the work of the Green River Killer? And two, was Dayton Leroy Rogers the Green River Killer? The answer to number one was no. It became obvious that the Green River Killer didn't commit these crimes as they were very different. The Malala Forest Killer seemed partial to stabbing and severing feet, whereas the Green River Killer focused on strangulation and sometimes posing the bodies in tableaus. It was also quickly determined that Dayton Rogers couldn't be the Green River Killer because that killer was active while Rogers was in prison for his two counts of coercion that I mentioned in last week's episode. The questions were good ones to have, even if they were debunked quickly, and that's because it turned out that the victims were very similar. The Green River Killer primarily hunted sex workers and the occasional teen runaway, and it would soon become apparent after the autopsies were completed and identifications were made that the Malala Forest Killer also hunted sex workers. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha is the original for luxuriously soft and sustainable bedding, bath, and apparel made from bamboo viscose. Caraloha offers multiple styles and sizes in a magnitude of colors so you can match your perfect style. Personally, I'm a stan for their sheets. I love my Caraloha sheets because they're so soft and luxurious. It gives me even more of a reason to stay in bed longer. And when I say soft, I'm talking softer than a thousand count Egyptian cotton sheets. Not only that, but bamboo is the most sustainable, renewable resource on the planet. Caraloha uses rain-fed organic bamboo, which gives you peace of mind knowing you're making a positive difference for the planet. So say goodbye to your boring old cotton sheets and aloha and mahalo to the luxuriously super soft and sustainable Caraloha sheets. Caraloha is giving our listeners 25% off their order by using the code RAIN. This code doesn't last forever, so hurry and head to C-A-R-I-L-O-H-A dot com and use code R-A-I-N to receive 25% off your order. One of the most exciting things about a new year is that you have no idea what adventures are in store for you. From new travel experiences to new jobs or picking up new skills, there's no better way to prepare for 2023 than by learning a new language with Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can feel confident no matter where the new year takes you. I started using Babbel three months ago to learn Spanish, and I ended up choosing it because Spanish is spoken in 21 countries, and your girl loves to travel. But when I started, I didn't have any specific plans. But now, I'm headed to Mexico, and I get to flex those new language skills. With Babbel, you only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson, so you can start having real-life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash rain. That's babbel.com slash rain for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life.
One of the most exciting things about a new year is that you have no idea what adventures are in store for you. From new travel experiences to new jobs or picking up new skills, there's no better way to prepare for 2023 than by learning a new language with Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can feel confident no matter where the new year takes you. And as someone who struggled to learn Spanish in a classroom setting, I appreciate that the app is at my fingertips, I can do it on my schedule, and the segments are only 10 minutes long. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Right now, get up to 55% off of your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash rain. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash rain for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. All seven of the bodies had autopsies conducted within a week of discovery. The state medical examiner that conducted the autopsies said that all of the bodies were so badly decomposed that it wasn't possible to determine the exact cause of death. All of them were listed as Jane Doe on their death certificates, and their cause of death was noted as homicidal violence of undetermined type. He believed that they had all been in the forest from one to three months. While all of them sustained stab wounds to their lower backs, he wasn't able to conclusively state that that's why any of them died, particularly due to the torture they each endured. The knife used would have been a single-edged knife with a blade anywhere from one to five inches long, which was also consistent with the same knife that Rogers used to kill Jenny Smith. Four of the Malala forest bodies had enough flesh intact that they could be identified through fingerprinting. The remaining victims would have to be identified in other ways. Detectives threw themselves into looking into the many missing persons cases in Clackamas County and surrounding areas. It was essential that they could give names to the Jane Doe's found in the Malala Forest and pursue justice. Jane Doe, or body number two, was in her early 20s at her time of death. She was Caucasian and stood about 5 foot 6 inches with long, curly, reddish-brown hair. There were pieces of green glass shards from an unknown object in her hair. She had multiple tattoos, one on her bum that said biker Harley Davidson bitch, and she had another on her shoulder that was a unicorn or a pegasus. Her femur had a large cut all the way down to the bone, and both her feet were cut or sawed off well above her ankles. The medical examiner noted that there were several false start marks. Um, I don't know if you know what those are, mm, mm -hmm. but that's like when you go to cut a bone and you have to start and stop. Yeah. They call that a false start. So they found several of them, and they believe that indicated she may have been awake and saw what was happening. So a truly horrific end of life. And were the feet recovered at the scene, or were things just so scattered that they just couldn't tell? I believe they did. Okay. I um, And I'm sorry. I know I specifically said one of them. They found them underneath her. Oh, I right. I do believe they found everyone's feet. Okay. Um, How, I mean, as if that's any more strange, but it's all strange. But you, but, I well, mean, you would almost think he'd take them or something? Well, and like, you think back know. to a, the case I did a couple of years ago, uh, Brutos, yeah. Jerry Brutos, yeah. he, he did keep body parts. Yeah. So it is interesting. Like, why go like through the effort just, of cutting yeah, it? Yeah, that it's just that experience. And Ooh. that's why I think they do believe he did it while they were alive, because oh, that it was part of their part of the torture, part of his Ugh. enjoyment. And you got a letter from this guy? Ugh. Jane Doe number two was the first to be identified, and it happened rather quickly, within days of her autopsy. Due to her distinctive tattoos, Portland area detectives contacted those working on this case to mention that they thought the victim was likely missing 23-year-old Lisa Marie Mock. The last known person to speak to Lisa was her grandmother in California. She called her grandmother Collect on July 22nd, just after 7.30 p.m. She explained that her husband was physically abusing her and that she was planning to leave him and go to an abuse center. Her grandmother confirmed over the phone that she had a tattoo that said bitch, and it was from her time hanging out with bikers and the Hell's Angel gang, which is interesting, fun yeah. fact there. But she also had a tattoo of a unicorn on her shoulder. 
Police confirmed the match by contacting Lisa's former dentist in California so that they could compare her dental records to the body, and it was a match. The green glass that they found in the last uh -huh. person's hair, did they? that makes me think of a booze bottle, alcohol, like wine or whiskey yeah. or something. Did they determine what, that doesn't sound like a vodka bottle. They don't determine what it is, but we will talk about it again. Oh. Uh, but I also agree with you. Green glass was used in a lot of different types of alcohol yeah. and wine bottles, but it's not a common thing we see. And I can't, I don't know how common it was in the 80s, though. Maybe it I was do, more. I feel like I can picture more like kind of. Like a Coke bottle? Feel, yeah, but oh, I feel like everything gotcha, yeah. was kind of oh, yeah, that, colored that was glass, glass of the 70s and 80s. Yeah, I don't really know. But now I have another thing to spiral on later. <laughs> Jane Doe, number seven, whose remains were scattered by animal activity, was in her 30s. She stood about five feet, eight inches tall and was Caucasian with dark brown hair. Her nose showed signs of having a previous healed fracture. While she didn't have any cut marks on her feet or legs, she had several stab wounds to her lower back, which was likely her cause of death. About a week after the autopsy, potential matches were narrowed down from the missing persons reports, and thanks to dental charts provided by her dentist, she was ID'd as Maureen Ann Hodges. According to Maureen's family, they hadn't heard from her since mid-July. She had started doing drugs at the age of 14 and dropped out of high school her freshman year. Ever since, she alternated working the streets or working as a housekeeper at motels. She put her first child up for adoption knowing her lifestyle wasn't appropriate. She participated in sex work in order to support her heroin addiction, but she did try several times to kick that addiction. Detectives visited her last known boyfriend in the room he lived in in the Fairfield Hotel in downtown Portland. He explained how Maureen was raped in May of 1987 on Union Avenue. Now, if you, if you remember, Union Avenue was the same location where Dayton Rogers picked up Jennifer Smith. Oh, so these ladies okay. were likely crossing paths. When asked if she ever acted oddly or told him any odd stories, he said one time he had told her how nice her feet looked and how a foot fetishist would find them attractive. And she reacted really bad to that comment. It, it clearly struck a nerve in her. And for some reason, he remembered that. After speaking to the boyfriend, detectives visited her ex-husband. He was also asked about odd stories that she may have told him, and one in particular stood out. He said there was a guy that Maureen said would take his dates up to the woods where he would tie them up and do things to their feet, uh, cut them, masturbate to them, you name it. He couldn't remember the guy's name, but he knew that Maureen was scared of him. Jane Doe, or body number five, was Caucasian and in her early to mid-30s. She was estimated at five feet, two inches tall. She wore an upper denture plate, which was still in place when they found her body. She had several missing teeth and very poor dental hygiene. Her right foot had been removed in a similar fashion to the others with several false start cut marks. Her hands, which were above her head, had been bound with a dog collar. A few weeks after her autopsy, Jane Doe number five was identified as 35-year-old Christine Lotus Adams. Her identity was actually released to the public, and a sex worker named Darla reached out to detectives. She had been the one that notified police about Christine's disappearance. She explained that they actually worked as a pair, similar to Jenny and her mm -hmm. pair in the last mm -hmm. episode, uh, mainly for safety. She described Christine as fun, maybe a little crazy, but mentioned how she looked forward to meeting someone and getting married. But until then, she worked the streets to put food on the table for her kids. Christine was from Portland originally and had five siblings. Like Maureen, she had dropped out of high school, and at the age of 16, she got pregnant. Christine had issues with cocaine and became a sex worker at the age of 20 to support her kids and her habit. Jane Doe, or body number three, was a female Caucasian or Caucasian mongoloid mix with long brown hair. She stood roughly five foot six inches tall. She was likely in her late 20s or early 30s at her time of death and had at least one surgery to her jaw and would have had a noticeable overbite. In addition to the deep cut she sustained from groin to sternum, her right nipple had been cut with a knife and the left had been completely sliced off. And I do not think they found it. 
a little over a month after the autopsies, a phone tip came in that suggested one of the victims might be 26-year-old Nandis or Nani K. Cervantes. Nani's Arizona family confirmed she had had jaw surgery. She had an arrest record, which means she was fingerprinted. As body number three was one of the bodies that had tissue in place, they were able to compare the prints and confirm that it was her. Nani was originally from Tempe, Arizona. After locating a family member who lived in the Portland area, they learned that no one had seen or spoken to Nani in two to three months. The last time anyone had seen her was likely July 24th in Portland, where she was living at a hotel downtown, and it was known for drugs, alcohol, and prostitution. They said Nani was a known drug and alcohol user who regularly injected cocaine and heroin, but they were not sure that she worked as a sex worker. Upon looking into her record, there was an interesting arrest noted. Apparently, in early July, a phone call was made regarding a female exposing her genitals. When police arrived at the Baptist Church on Elm Street in Camby, they found a woman lying on the ground naked behind a tree masturbating. She then realized people were watching. She sat up, stared at them, but made no attempt to stop or cover herself up. Officers realized she was incredibly intoxicated. They found her clothes nearby, helped her put them on, and then they arrested her. Side note, I think you would like this, but when they asked her, what's your name? She said, Linda Blair, and I'm going to throw up all over you. (laughs) That's fantastic. I know. So I thought, you know, she definitely had her own demons, but she had a sense of humor. And so I kind of liked that story a little bit. Obviously, it's dark, but. Well, I think it paints like uh, not only that she had that humor, but also just like that she was in a bad place and, yeah. you know, you, she just maybe didn't catch his vibe or whatever because she was intoxicated and he, and that just shows how predatory he was. Yeah. And obviously she went missing probably days after that incident. Yeah. Uh, so that's just tragic that that's the last story people will, well, hopefully her family does not. Right. But, you know, that's one of the last stories people remember of her. Yeah. Or that's what's like public. Right. Oh, we found a body. Oh, we ID'd it. Oh, here she was being arrested. It's like, yeah, that was one moment of her life. Jane Doe, or body number one, was a Caucasian female in her teens to early 20s. She had reddish brown hair, stood approximately five feet, two inches tall, and had evidence of a previous surgery in her pelvic region. She had six stab wounds to her lower back. Her foot had been cut or sawed off above the ankle. And I'm very sorry to share that the cut actually went 80% through the bone and the rest was broken. Oof. Total, truly awful. Like what kind of monster do you have to be to do that? That's sick. By November 2nd, another ID was made thanks to dental records. Body number one was that of 16-year-old Riatha Marie Giles. Riatha had several previous surgeries at Portland's Shriner Hospital due to her congenitally dislocated hips. Riatha's family confirmed that she was a sex worker who regularly worked on 82nd Avenue near Powell Boulevard. Police located her boyfriend, Leonard Thornton, who mentioned the last time he saw her was on July 22nd when he dropped her off on 82nd to begin work. Riatha's family mentioned that they did know of another sex worker that she used to hang out with, a girl named Dee Dee. Her boyfriend actually knew Dee Dee's full name, which was Cynthia Diane Dever. Jane Doe, or body number four, was in her late 20s to early 30s when she died. She was a Caucasian with long, curly brown hair and was about five feet, four inches tall. She didn't sustain any cuts to her feet or ankles, but she had several stab wounds to her lower back. Oddly enough, the identification of Jane Doe number four came right after Riatha. Riatha's friend Dee Dee, or Cynthia, was of keen interest to detectives. As they looked into her background, they realized the last time anyone had seen her was on July 11th, yet no missing person report was filed. Hmm. So another sex worker they interviewed named Tracy uh, had actually talked to them several times due to her previous interactions with Rogers. But it wasn't until their last interview that they realized she was one of the last people to ever see Dee Dee. The night of July 11th, Dee Dee was waiting for a date. Only days prior, Tracy had told Dee Dee about a guy in a light blue truck who had taken her up to the forest, hogtied her, pulled a knife on her, molested her feet, and then cut them with a knife. 
He also told her he planned to kill her. Now, Tracy wanted to make sure that Dee Dee avoided this guy if she saw him, but sadly, she did end up taking a date with him because by January of 1988, Cynthia Diane Dever was identified as Jane Doe number four through dental records. That was lucky. That was a lucky. Yeah. Like their interviewing was so thorough on these. It's really, it's Which really, is impressive. really impressive, especially being a sex bunch of workers. sex workers. Yeah. Yes, they did a good job. There are things that will kind of make you cringe. I, one of them I'm going to say later. But overall, for the 80s, for working with sex workers, right. like they did a good job. Was she the only one to not have her feet damaged? I believe, or the only body that had I believe them. so, which makes you wonder, was it hurried? Yeah, it makes me think, like, did he hear someone walking through the woods or did mm-hmm. something happen that he had to just, like, get out of there? It also kind of reinforces the idea that he liked to do it when they were alive. Maybe she died oh. too quickly. Maybe he hit an artery when he stabbed her in the back. Oh, that's and, a good theory. Yeah, so I do think that um, while they'll, they'll never be able to officially prove it right. unless he tells tells people, I do think it's a good guess. It's like a super small town, right? Malala or wherever. Where yeah. They, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, so Clackamas County took it over, which is much larger as it seeps into Portland areas, too. But. They could not ignore it since all the bodies were found yeah. at once. Oh, now, I was oh, just yeah. thinking that if he yeah. had scattered those bodies, how, maybe they wouldn't. And they found them once a year mm-hmm. and once every couple of years. It probably wouldn't have even, it'd be in the back page of the news, but, you know, Hooker's body found in the woods. But on the alternative side of that is Green River Killer was active at this point. They were very worried about because he was the most oh, prolific. That's true. Yeah. So I think all eyes were kind of realizing these girls are very vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, we got to we got to catch this guy. Yeah. So I do think and there that's were a, a lot huge of motivations. news story, too, to be like, we found a graveyard. Oh, yeah, especially for Clackamas County police. Yeah. Like, th- that's huge. Yeah, so it probably had a lot of heat on it, for sure, is why they were extra diligent with their but work. But I have to say, they did a great job over a short amount of time. Like, I, every, the book I read, I'm just impressed. That's nice to hear. That, yeah. That's so nice. <laughs> and novel. I have so <laughs> many things coming down the pipe that are just... <laughs> Uh, I was talking to a family and they were like, well, we're not like F the police. So I will. Just upset. I, yeah. And I'm like, girl, I am because like every single case. Well, I'm just going to say to the listeners who occasionally reach out and say, oh, you hate the police. Like sometimes they do a good job. You're right. They do sometimes. Yeah. This is a case where they did. But we know it's far more often that our case has. Why the fuck did they do that? There's that a way? reason that we're thrilled to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> it's an anomaly. Jane Doe, or body number six, was in poor condition as it had been disturbed by animal activity. She was roughly 20 to 32 years old and about five feet tall, described as stocky with crooked front teeth, one of which had been chipped. She was of mixed race, potentially American Indian or Asian and Caucasian. Attempts were made to cut off her feet but abandoned as they were still intact. Unfortunately, Jane Doe number six, who likely went missing in 1986 or 1987, could not be identified. Several composite sketches were made to try to circulate her image and generate tips, but she would go unidentified for many, many years. By the time the Jane Doe's were matched to their real identities, prosecution was gearing up for Dayton Leroy Rogers' trial for the murder of Jenny Smith. I mentioned to you last week that they couldn't use any of the new information gathered from the Malala Forest bodies in Jenny's case. And due to a single vote against it, the jury convicted him to life in prison instead of the death penalty. This pissed a lot of people off. They believed Rogers to be a torturous monster. And even if the jury wouldn't admit it, he was going to hurt someone else. So when it came out that the same man was linked to the multiple tortured bodies discovered in the Malala Forest, people were pleased that they had a second chance to sentence him to death. For two months, detectives who worked closely on the Jenny Smith trial vigorously worked at buttoning up the case against Rogers for the serial murders of the women found in the Malala Forest. Victory was sweet when the Oregon grand jury indicted Rogers for the murders of Lisa Mock, Christine Adams, Nani Cervantes, Riatha Giles, Cynthia Dever, and Maureen Hodges. Sadly, as Jane Doe number six was not yet identified, even though investigators were sure the same person murdered her, Rogers was not charged with her murder. What? Oh, I know, girl. You just wait. It gets worse. What's the lack of connection? Same area, same wound, same cause of death. 
here's just because they couldn't say like, oh, she was a sex worker and picked up. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I wish there was recording that I could learn more about the trial because a lot of and I'll talk about this later. There are some confusing aspects that I'm mm. like, we wouldn't do it this way. Yeah. This would not. This is not how it would go down. Yeah. But we'll we'll get into that later. Oh, good. The jury selection began in February of 1989. And right out of my dream scenario, they settled on an all-female jury. Ooh, I'm shocked that the, the defense I know. let that happen. I don't know wow. how that happened, but it's amazing. They even, their like thir- 13th juror, the like backup, was also female. Wow. The trial kicked off on March 30th, 1989. Prosecution came in hot, claiming that Rogers had killed these women with the same knife he used to kill Jenny Smith, effectively bringing in the previous case he was already convicted for into this new trial. He detailed the severe torture each woman endured and brought well over a dozen witnesses that could attest to dates with Rogers that became violent or unusual, the majority of which could tie him to other cases with his odd habits of screwdrivers, feet, and knives. Some of the strongest evidence came from the wood stove used to burn Jenny's belongings in last week's episode. If you recall, several other items were found in that stove, and many of them were standouts in this trial. Rogers' father-in-law, Roy, testified about the items he found in the wood stove after he had gotten suspicious from a conversation he had with his son-in-law. Inside that stove were pieces of glass and clothing grommets that were directly correlated with the Malala forest victims. A 15-year-old named Floria testified about the star-shaped grommets recovered from the stove. She recognized them. (gasps) They belonged to her mother, Christine Adams. They came from a pair of pants that she often wore. The glass found in the stove matched perfectly with the pieces found in Lisa Mock's hair. So while we don't know where that glass came from, it was found in two places, Josh. Interesting. So that's how that ties together. Did you say in a stove? Yeah, so he tried to burn it. So that's made me wonder, like, was it a glass bottle he hit her with and then took it to get rid of it? Like it had blood on it, maybe? Yeah, because obviously it was on her and then he brought it to the stove. It's not like it came from his home. So what if he offered her, like in a lot of these cases, the gals drank something. What if he offered her a soda bottle? She drank from it. He used it, hit her. It broke as he's gathering Stuffed because he likes to take their belongings and burn them. Right. He gathers that too, puts it in the stove. Or he was keeping it as a trophy and only put it in the stove when he realized or it when could, he killed Jenny. Or it could have like been on her stuff. Like if he if he used it to incapacitate her. Yeah. And then maybe it broke and just shards were like all over her, depending on how big the bottle was. Uh-huh. And then taking her stuff. It oh, was, it was just like by in the clothing. Stance, yeah. Either yeah, way, I mean, wow, smoking yeah. gun, smoking yeah. bottle. Yeah. There were hairs found in his truck that matched Lisa Mock, Nani Cervantes, and Cynthia Dever. And let's not forget Steve's screwdriver. Boy, did Deo have a love of OJ and vodka. Not only was the screwdriver his signature drink, but the prosecution argued that it was part of his signature. Every body in the forest had remnants of his mini liquor bottles and individual OJ containers nearby. This could also be tied to his personal vehicle thanks to that safety cap. My favorite line by the prosecutor was, quote, If there is a signature to a crime, you can look at the signature and see the identity of the killer. This evidence is the mark of Zorro. It's the signature of the defendant. Ladies and jury, he not only committed these murders but might as well have written his name on the victim's corpses. Nice. I know. What what a closing. (laughs) The trial took several weeks to complete, but after nearly six hours of deliberation, the jury found Rogers guilty of aggravated murder for all six women. On June 7th, 1989, the jury reached a decision on how he should be punished. After 17 hours of deliberation, all 12 women voted that he should receive the death penalty and die by lethal injection. Now, after his conviction in 1989, a long-running game of legal ping-pong would take place. This can be rather confusing, so I figured it would be easiest to go through a timeline with a brief summary of what actually happened. Three years after his conviction, Dayton Leroy Rogers and his legal team were successful at winning a second penalty trial in 1992. 
He appealed his death penalty conviction and he won. The Oregon Supreme Court overturned his death sentence. In 1994, the win changed and his penalty trial resulted in a reinstatement of the death penalty for the Malala Forest murders. By the year 2000, it changed again, and he won a third penalty trial, and the Oregon Supreme Court overturned that 1994 death sentence. They claimed that the judge in that case should have allowed the jury to consider life without parole instead of the death penalty. Now, in his initial trial for the Malala murders, that wasn't an option. They were basically determining whether or not the death penalty suited the case. And if one of the one or more of the jurors voted against that, it would have defaulted to life. And at the time, that indicated some sort of parole, likely after 30 years. In 2006, Rogers was back in court and again sentenced to death, which was overturned yet again by the Oregon State Supreme Court in 2012. So let's take a break from the legal ping pong. Um, because something exciting happened in 2013. 26 years after the discovery of the Malala Forest bodies, the remaining victim, Jane Doe number 6, was finally identified. Oh, amazing. Thanks to DNA testing, which was now available, Jane Doe, who was described as short, stocky, of Asian and Caucasian mix, was officially identified as 18-year-old Tanya Jury Johnson. Tanya was last seen in the Eugene area in April of 1987. The vehicle that she had driven was later found abandoned in Portland. And that's all we know about her. There's really not a lot that I can find. Two years after her identification, Rogers was back in court as he was tied to Tanya's murder. Hell yeah. He admitted that he in fact had killed her, making him responsible for eight total murders. In court, he said, quote, The enormity of my crimes makes the word sorry all but inadequate and would seem like an insult to even say it. But I still need to say it whether it's received or not. I am sorry. So very sorry. Because of what I've done and caused, I have literally sentenced the lives and hearts of the victims' families to a lifetime of precious loss and sorrow. I have found a real relationship with my creator and God, which has changed my life. And that is why I am not now and have not been, nor will I ever be, a danger in prison society. So he was under no impression he was ever going to leave prison. So I am glad he admitted it, and I am glad he apologized, but If you're so sorry, then why are you continually going to court and continually bringing it up for these families and constantly fighting what sentence you get, you poor little baby man, when you know that you've done that to those families? So which is it? (sighs) Frustratingly, it's not very clear how the conviction worked on this case, So, which I mean, Tanya's murder. After reading several documents, I think when he admitted the guilt, she was lumped in with the other six victims. So it wasn't like, oh, okay. I don't think he was getting an actual conviction for each person. It was like a group, right? which is confusing, but may come up later. So okay. like nowadays... It would be very clear in the court documentation you get life for this person, right. you get life for this person. Yeah, you this get... charges for this crime. Right. Yeah. But when looking at this and on his prisoner vine, it is one entry. So it huh. makes me wonder. Anyway, back to the legal ping pong. He was once again sentenced to death uh, in 2015. So that was the Tanya admission. I believe they were re- like doing his punishment again. Okay. And they are like, nope, death penalty stays. But now enters 2019, and we have previously talked about this in another episode. I think it was the What Happens in the House episode. Mm. In 2019, the Senate Bill 1103 was introduced, and this bill essentially changed the crimes that qualified as aggravated murder, thus the crimes that could get you the death penalty. Quote, the crime currently only applies to murders of children younger than 14 years old, murders of law enforcement officers, terrorist attacks that kill at least two people and prison killings carried out by someone who's previously been convicted of murder. So no longer does Dayton Leroy Rogers fall into aggravated murder, which means it is not legal for him to have the death penalty. Well, first off, it's ridiculous that he wouldn't. Why wouldn't serial killer be on there? Secondly, Oregon is like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. 
like that's so much formality he's going through and it's like I can't remember I don't know the date of when Oregon last put someone to death it was the 80s yeah so due to that change in 2021 Rogers's death penalty sentence was once again overturned this meant that he would get yet another penalty trial and learn what his sentence would now be since he legally can't be on death row His legal team hoped to sentence him under the rules that were in place in 1987 when the murders occurred. That would mean life with the possibility of parole after 30 years. If they did treat each victim as a separate conviction, which I'm not sure they did, it would be up to the judge whether that was concurrent or consecutive. So Mm. that's you can do the math here. That's very different. It's like 30 years versus 210 years, assuming Tanya is included. The prosecution, on the other hand, wanted to pursue our current rules, which would allow life without parole or a true life sentence. And I have to agree with them. If you're now saying there's a change in death penalty law, there should be that should also be accompanied by the new rule. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Rogers was in court in April of 2022 for the penalty phase, but it got delayed. And I can't find anything that says whether or not the reschedule has already happened. Oh, So we may have that update to look forward to. But he is listed in the Oregon prisoner fine system, and he has a single entry for aggravated murder for life. And I think he may have already served his time for Jenny Smith's murder, and that was removed. So it's just that one entry for those seven Malala murders. Wow. Yeah. Now, I have an interesting tidbit to share. Now, I have known who Dayton Rogers is for years, but I never read a book about him. I only knew him from like what I learned on TV or just, you know, my own perusal Mm -hmm. of the weird websites I visit. But when I read this book, I learned that in the trial, something came up and this is totally new information to me. He apparently had a homosexual relationship in his past. He would go visit this person a couple of times per year for several years while he was married. And the people that knew about this assumed he might be bisexual. This ended up becoming a factor in the trial because one of the psychologists believed that since he had previously had a homosexual relationship, he might do it again in prison. And that might make him a risk of escalating to male victims. And I had to tell you that because the terminology escalate to male victims is reminiscent of that fucking Uh form I was telling you about in that other case. Yeah. In the unprecedented case. It's so misogynistic and it sounds like you're putting men on a pedestal. Guys, this could be really bad. He could kill a man. I I have to think they don't mean it that way. And it's just like people. I think more just like the um, the psychology of it. Well, and a danger to the prison community. And yeah, the prison community. To where it's like, oh, guys, he might have a sexual relationship and then whatever in his brain activates. And then he's tying this guy up and strangling him in a in a cell yeah, it could or something. Be. It could have been an argument for giving him the death penalty. Uh, I found I just found the terminology oh, so yeah. interesting and so it, ridiculous. And it ties to our unprecedented ep- unprecedented episode. Like, what the fuck? We need to work on that, I think. Yeah. But then I thought, well, maybe there is in psychology people who have both female and male victims. Maybe they are worse. Maybe they're more likely to be on the higher end of that yeah, scale. Yeah, maybe because then it's like anybody in your path yeah. is in danger. Right. You Kind of like uh, that other Patreon episode I did where he just didn't discriminate. He yeah. killed whoever he could. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Josh, uh, no, do I you? Just, I, I just like didn't even know this guy. I'd heard his name, but I was so young Which when it happened. Which is crazy because he's like the worst Oregon serial yeah, killer. It's kind of surprising, especially like with how horrific the murders were. Like it is kind of surprising that it just I haven't heard of him or I haven't no, seen I more things. On well, and him. if you think it's so disturbing when you think about last week's episode, when I talked about his upbringing and how he was raised to just believe women were scum of the earth. Yeah. Especially sexually promiscuous women. And yet he was const He had this need for sex that couldn't be fulfilled by his wife. So he would seek out uh, women of the night and then he would hurt them. It's like he didn't believe they were human. And yeah. he just do these horrible things like their last few moments were so utterly painful yeah and that's so sad like and i can do this to you because you're less than and you deserve to be punished for doing that to me and he would get a boner with you and he would get a boner over it like he would it's so disturbing like how how do people become that 
Well, luckily he's found grace with his creator, so. I I hope that's true. I hope he has remorse, but I mean, he knows he's not going anywhere. Yeah. And for at least he's not that delusional. But anyway, if you're interested, I read the book Bloodlust Portrait of a Serial Sex Killer by Gary C. King, and I highly recommend it. There are so many details in this case that I couldn't even pack into two episodes. So check it out and we'll have it linked. I'm hot. You're not. I don't really give up about trying to top that. Yeah, am I, am I hungry? Do I have heartburn? Yeah, like, that's that. how I feel all diarrhea. day today. Oh, that sucks. So does diarrhea. I'm really sad my mic was off when I said diarrhea. <laughs> Me too. It, sound, it was really musical. <laughs> diarrhea. Oh, that was good. You sound like us. Nope. God damn. <laughs> of Lisa? No. Uh, Quietly made his way through the. Oh. <laughs> I thought it said bush, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and the third molars or wisdom teeth had not yet erupted. Abrupt, ab- erupted. Oh my god. <laughs> <clears throat> there were s- what? Uh, uh, this is pronounced babupted. <laughs> <laughs> Whoop! Oh, hello. Uh, esophagus <laughs> wanted to say hi. <laughs> is that what they call it? Haggis. Soft haggis? Don't know. Oh. Maybe. I thought I thought haggis was stomach lining. Hey man, I don't know. <laughs> hey, 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 hey! I didn't go to college, <laughs> and I'm not gonna. I'm not well, going to. Well, I majored in Scottish foods, and I say, <laughs> oh, what a major! Oh. <laughs> yeah. I only know like two: a Scotch egg. Don't know if that's Scottish, and haggis. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right, back to biz. Going off script already. It's a new <laughs> record. We call it podcast jazz. But yeah, I like that. I'm, <laughs> I'm riffing. <clears throat> Sweet up. <laughs> Squeeze a booby dooby. That's right. <laughs> All of the evidence that could be. <laughs> I give up on life. Perfect. <clears throat> to be continued next week, everybody. <laughs> it's a three parter. And maybe even four or five. We just don't know. We're, we're going the Quibi way. This Ten minute is episode. Jazz, bitch. <laughs> okay, I got this. One paragraph at a time. Yeah, you got it. The crime scene had. Oh, there we go. I One word put at a, a time. D on it, like you used to do. <laughs> if you like it, then you should have put a D on it. <laughs> I said no instead of now. I think so. I think no. Oh, why is it so hard? <laughs> And I would appreciate it if you don't make 10 minute long bloopers of me this week. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We'd appreciate it too. <laughs> Fuck you. Uh, JK, JK. Well, I was just going to say, I don't know if I'd say key ingredients for a screwdriver because they're like the only ones. Yeah, who cares? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> also, let, oh, people, I... let people comment that. <laughs> okay. He made him take a look at mugshots, specifically including, yeah, specifically including. <laughs> Took it mug shots. Uh, take a look at mug shots, especially including. I did it. <laughs> I thought I did it, and I did it, and then I did it, and then he did. But he did accurately pick out the light blue trick, trick up truck. <sighs> he did accurately pick out. Pick out the light. Pick out the light blue truck. He did accurately pick out the light blue trick. Oh my god! It's too hard to say. It's too hard to say. It's trick up puck. <laughs> it's official. It's too hard. She had been walking toward Hubbard when he pulled up next to her and offered her to. Oh my god! Okay, what is wrong with me? Just take a breath. Take a take a breath. Just that, relax. That's not going to help. No, I've been breathing this and whole time. <laughs> I do not know the difference between doves and pr- pigeons, but I assume they're different species. So don't ask me that, Josh. Oh no, he <laughs> loves asking dove specific questions. So now we're after the break, boobity boobity, pigeony pigeony. <laughs> Early to mid thirty. Oh, jeez. <sighs> <sighs> drugs, drugs and alcohol. What did I say? Drug and alcohol. Because that's what I wrote. Oddly enough, 
Oh, well, then oh, keep it. Because I did not read what it, I said here. Okay, let's read what I said. Okay. Look at that, a complete sentence. <laughs> the pot. Oh, my. This is going to be a long day. Okay. That's all. We got nothing long else day. to do. It is going to be a long day. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production. Written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough. Edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls.